Hello everyone, welcome to our brown bag. Today's speaker is Robert Jameson from the Department of History and the title of his talk is clearly visible, a network or a leash competing through the Iron Curtain in the 1980s. Uh, before I introduce um, Robert Jameson, let me just invite you to the two remaining brown bag lectures this semester. And they both take place in December, one's on December 3rd, and Professor Nana Tarkova uh, will be talking about art and the Red Army. And on December 10th, we'll have a guest speaker from the University of Minnesota, Professor Kathleen Collins, whose topic is the rise of Islamist movements in Central Asia. I also would like to invite all of you to the Crease uh, holiday mixer, which will be happening on Friday, December 6th at 5 p.m. at the Watkins Museum on Massachusetts Street. So you're all very welcome to come. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Let me uh, just introduce our speaker. I'll be using his own words. Uh, Robert Jameson is a seventh year PhD student in the KU Department of History patiently advised by Dr. Nathan Wood. A proud native of St. Paul, Minnesota, Bob is writing a dissertation on the history of personal computing in late socialist Czechoslovakia, a topic he originally and quite accidentally stumbled upon in 2014. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Uh, and I'll stand just because I tend to move around when I talk, so I might as well just give in to that impulse now. Uh, as Justina said, the title of my talk is A Network or a Leash, Computing Through the Iron Curtain in the 1980s. And I'll be talking specifically about the case study of Czechoslovakia, which is the country that I have, uh, well, the Czech Republic is the country that I've worked in for some time now. Uh, so before I begin with this, I'd like to say a big thank you to Kreese for inviting me to give this talk. Um, to the Fulbright Commission of the Czech Republic and the U.S. State Department for funding the research that led to this talk, uh, and of course for the History Department for sustaining my work for the last seven years. So with that covered, uh, one of the things I want to talk today about is the concept of technological networks and whether you're fully participating in or fully enrolled in a technological network, um, whether you're not enrolled or participating in the technological network, or in the case of Czechoslovakia, as I will argue, the benefits and the costs of what I call partial network engagement. So what are these technological networks? Well, an example of a technological network might be something classically, as Thomas P. Hughes has argued, like an electrical grid, right? Um, so as we all know, whenever you flip a switch in a room and the power for the lights comes on, you're participating as an actor in this much larger network, this much larger technological network of the electrical grid, um, which involves everything from the wiring in this building, in this room, to the uh, power lines that are extending to the transformers that go all the way back to the power plants and distant locations that supply you with electricity in the first place. So for the most part, we tend to think of technological networks as a net positive, right? By being enrolled in a technological network, whether it's the electrical grid, or motorized traffic, for example, uh, which involves cars, roads, stoplights, automobile production facilities. Uh, you're gaining a lot of opportunities and affordances that you wouldn't normally have. Uh, everything from electrical power to the ability to move very quickly through cities. Um, however, oftentimes with built out technological networks, there are lots of costs, lots of risks that are associated with them. Uh, so some of these are sunk costs. Uh, once you commit to building out the infrastructure for a technological network, whether that's the electrical grid or computer production and distribution, uh, you're really committing over a long term, sometimes decades, to a particular kind of technology that often fails to anticipate uh, what are called orthogonal risks. A uh, good example of that right now, if you've been paying attention to the wildfires that have been happening in Northern California, is the Pacific Gas and Electric Utility, PG&E, uh, which runs the power lines and distributes electrical power throughout California, especially Northern California. This system of power was built out decades ago uh, at a time when climate change was not really anticipated as a risk to the system of power distribution. Uh, 
But now we know that the decisions that were made at that time, decades ago, to build out power lines in a way that didn't anticipate climate change means that exposed power lines, rather than power lines buried underground, are liable to causing all kinds of electrical fires and, and, and wildfires in areas that have dried out um, and are more prone to natural fires and high winds, uh, as is the case today. So in the case of Czechoslovakia, and talking about computers more specifically, uh, partial network engagement, sort of dipping your toes into the water to test the temperature, is oftentimes the smartest strategy when you're uncertain about the future direction uh, or the future paradigm that a technology will take. So from the perspective of policymakers and planners in Czechoslovakia and other countries around the world in the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, they're not really sure where computing is going to head. Up until that time, the dominant paradigm in computing was the mainframe and the minicomputer. You accessed computing power uh, for all your number crunching needs through terminals that were connected to distant mainframes, distant powerful computers. And the advent of personal computing, where you had a lot of that same power uh, closer to you, where you could actually interact with and program uh, your own programs, that was a brand new concept in the late 70s. And really, even a company as savvy as IBM doesn't fully jump into that race until 1981. So for policymakers and planners in socialist countries, what do you do? How do you plan for the future? What do you invest in? So they choose partial participation. They choose limited distributed engagement in different kinds of technological networks, as I will argue. Uh, they participate in something called the Soviet Unified System of Computing in the 1970s. Uh, they also participate in the Western network of computing. They purchase computers from Western companies, especially Siemens in West Germany, uh, but also IBM. Um, and they also try to develop their own nascent domestic computer industry. So these are really three different directions. Uh, participating in a larger Comic-Con block project, participating in the broader networks of commodity computer exchange with the West by purchasing computers, and also attempting to have their own computer production and distribution within the country itself. So they're never fully leashed to one particular paradigmatic computing path. Why is that? So this is a long abstract, uh, but what I want to emphasize here is that the Czech and Slovak policymakers, when faced with a choice of which computing paradigm to choose, they chose not to choose. They chose to make small gambits, small investments uh, in a series of different computing paradigms because they didn't know how it would turn out. And as a small country, as a relatively poor country at the time, um, as is typical for a lot of countries around the world that are peripheral, that are not wealthy, that are outside global systems of power in many respects, uh, they chose to make these diverse series of small gambits. Now, this failed in the short term. And usually technology historians will look at this short-term failure under late socialism prior to the Revolution 89, uh, the 30th anniversary of which was just two days ago. Uh, they'll look at this short-term failure and they'll say, well, this is the end of the story. Socialists failed to develop a working, competitive, uh, computer industry in Czechoslovakia, which would actually supply the market with enough computers to satisfy businesses and individual consumers. And then the revolution happens, and then Western markets rush in and solve all these problems. But that's only half the story, because the Western markets that rush in to solve these problems, the foreign companies like IBM and Microsoft that come in and employ Czech and Slovak workers in the 90s, uh, the skilled workers do not emerge like Athena from the brow of Zeus uh, completely from nowhere. They come from somewhere. And where they come from is this milieu of the 1970s and 1980s under late socialism uh, when they are trained in an environment of scarcity and with excellent technical education to be skilled workers that are used to manipulating all different kinds of machines for their own ends. So some of the key ideas that I'm hoping to cover with you today uh, one, as I already mentioned, is technological uncertainty. What do you do when you're not sure where the future of this important technology is headed? As a policymaker, as a planner, what do you do? Well, if you're a small country uh, or you don't fully control the outcomes of that network, what you do is you engage in uh, 
what are called tactics rather than strategy, right? You seek to be, as an individual in the system, you seek to be an opportunist. You try to find computers wherever you can. You try to find software wherever you can. If you're in a country like Czechoslovakia in the 80s, that might mean you have to learn English because the only programming manual available to you is in English. And so you teach yourself, as one of my participants, Miroslav Bartoszek, did. It might mean that the only computer available to you is an older Soviet model. And so you have to learn to work with that rather than the cutting edge. So you engage in these tactics. On the level of the country itself, and not just the individual user, you're also engaging in tactics. Czechoslovakia doesn't have unlimited hard currency to spend on importing state-of-the-art Western computers. So what does it do? It buys what it can, what's available to it, some of which is embargoed by NATO um, all the way through the end of the 80s. Uh, it participates in that Soviet computer system, the unified system of computing that I referenced earlier. Uh, and it tries to develop its own computers so that's not totally dependent on foreign powers, either of the two imperial giants of the Cold War. So it seeks all these ways to get computers. I'm going to argue that this partial actor network participation, where the Czechs are not fully committing to the Soviet system, and they're not fully committing to the Western system and just purchasing computers from IBM and from Burroughs, um, and they're not fully committing to their own domestic industry because they realize that there are serious risks and problems. They can't do everything in-house as a small country. Uh, being partially involved in these actor networks means that you cover a lot of your bets. And it means that in the 1990s, after state socialism collapses in the country, that you already have a lot of existing vendor relationships. You already have a skilled user base that's familiar with how to work with IBM's OS2, for example. Um, you're not totally committed to a failed paradigm because you've covered your bets. Peripherality, the Czechoslovak experience here, is not just limited to the Czechoslovak experience. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Most countries in the 70s and 80s are facing the same dilemmas that Czechoslovakia is. With our limited money, how do we become modern? How do we participate in this computer revolution that we see unfolding around the world? So peripherality is really the norm. And the narrative that focuses excessively on Silicon Valley and innovation in California in the 1970s, 1980s misses out on a lot of the global picture. And finally, I'm going to argue that despite being unplanned, despite the lack of intentionality behind this partial network participation, uh, despite the failures of their stated goals in the 80s, that these failures and the scarcity of computing at the time actually result unintentionally in a kind of comparative advantage which is unique to these state socialist countries of Central and Eastern Europe. So, how do we get to the ultimate computer in the Czechoslovak case? Well, as I said, they're gambling on a kind of digital modernity. And in the 80s, there are various different interest groups within Czechoslovakia that are arguing for different pathways. So you have a lot of the policymakers who are wedded very closely to the Ministry of Industry, for example. And they're arguing that what is needed badly in Czechoslovakia is computerized production, computerized inventory control in the major factories, in the automotive production facilities. And so what they need are more mainframes and more mini computers. Those can come from JSEP and SMEP, which are the Czech terms for the unified system of computing uh, in the Soviet bloc. Those can come from the West. They don't care. They just want more computers for computerized production inventory control in industry. You have home users who are largely amateurs, often younger. And what they want computers for are, for the most part, games. But also, you have home users in the late 80s who want computers because they want spreadsheet software. They want text editing software. Um, and again, they don't really care if they're getting it from the West or if they're getting it from domestic microcomputer production facilities. They just want computers. There's a scramble for computers at the time. And finally, you have education reformers in Czechoslovakia, especially in the early 80s leading up to a critical Communist Party Congress in 84, the 16th Congress, which are arguing for investment in the schools. They're looking at computers and they're saying, this is clearly the future of the economy. This is the future of Czechoslovakia being competitive um, and really reforming our economy. So we need skilled young users. We need computers in schools. <laughs>
So there are sort of three different directions here. The home computing market focused on the individual consumer and also the social clubs. The government, which is largely focused on industrial reform. And school reformers, uh, the education market, which is focused on training the next generation. So I'll talk a little bit here about the unified system of computing, since this is the dominant paradigm of the three that Czechoslovakia is really heavily invested in. Uh, it's where a lot of their effort goes into. And the Czechoslovak computers that are designed and produced under the unified system of computing are designed and produced here initially at the, the Research Institute for Mathematical Machines in Prague. Uh, this is where software is written for many of those machines. This is where they're initially designed. Then the actual production is sent off to facilities that are run by Tesla, which is a major electronics concern in the country at the time. Um, and also other industrial concerns like ZPA in Novi Bor or Zoft in Banska Bystrica in Slovakia. Uh, and the software was adapted by programmers uh, like Václav Trojan or Jan Sokol, who, who signed Charter 77, the famous reformist manifesto, um, in the late 70s as well. So those computers um, that are part of the large system of unified computing, uh, the Jednotny System Elektronický Počítačů, um, these are initially planned out in 69. Uh, production on a larger scale starts later on in the 70s, roughly 71, 72. Um, and they produce computers like this EC1025 uh, mainframe here, uh, seen in 1978 at the Research Institute for Mathematical Machines. These are inspired by IBM System 370. Uh, and the software is a Soviet version of the software that's written by IBM for the System 370 machines. And these are largely intended for work in the bureaucracy work in offices, work in the factories. Um, and they're also, to some extent, sold overseas to international buyers in places like Egypt or India. There's also the so-called small system of electronic computers, uh, SMAP, which begins somewhat later in 74. Uh, and these small computers were not based on clones of IBM machines, uh, like the large computers were. They're based on clones of mini computers by the Digital Equipment uh, Corporation, DEC, uh, the PDP-11 specifically, and later on the VAX machines. Um, and the software, again, are variations of the software that uh, Digital Equipment Corporation had produced for the PDP-11. Um, so here you can see a Tesla, a Tesla made JPR-12, which is a clone of the PDP-11. 11 um, in a Teplice hospital in the early 80s. So as I said, the government is involved in the scramble for computers in the 80s uh, from virtually any direction. And initially, there are ideological concerns in the 70s and early 80s about where you're getting these computers from. The government is trying to prioritize acquisition of computers from the unified system uh, from other countries that are involved in Comic-Con, like Bulgaria, like East Germany, like Poland, like the Soviet Union. Uh, but unfortunately, the unified system is not really able to keep up with demand in Czechoslovakia for computers. And so as time goes on, what you see is that ideological concerns are diminishing. And even though it takes up scarce hard currency, the Czech government is choosing to invest in computers from outside the Soviet bloc especially from West Germany and the United States, which are the two largest suppliers at this time period. So if in 1981, only 15% of new computer purchases are coming from the West, broadly defined, uh, by 1988, which is the last year statistics were available to me at the Central Statistics Office in Prague, 30% uh, roughly of the government's computers are coming from capitalist countries. So in seven years, that figure has doubled, despite, again, how expensive the Western machines were for Czechoslovakia at the time. And as you can see, this is just a further demonstration. Uh, all the charts that you'll see in here are, are handmade by me, so I apologize if they're not as sophisticated as I would like them to be. However, uh, what this shows you, based on data, again, from the Central Statistical Office, is that the demand for computers in government ministries and in government as a whole is just exploding in the 1980s. It's starting from a very low base. I mean, you can number the amount of computers in Czechoslovakia in the early 70s, um, well, not on two hands, but it's below 100 for the whole country. It's a really very small number of computers distributed throughout the country. 
um, although they are the large mainframes, typically. But throughout the 80s, what you're seeing is this explosion in growth for demand of digital electronic computers and the ministries. And their engagement with JSEP, their engagement with SMEP, these two Soviet bloc-led uh, efforts to produce computers for industry, for the government, for the military, uh, it does bring them a lot of benefits, right? Uh, for starters, they get to burden share investment costs. That's not a small thing. When you're a country of 15 million people and you want to have state-of-the-art computers, or at least close to state-of-the-art computers, you want to be competitive in the wider economy of the globe, you are not able to afford, as a small country of 15 million people, to completely develop or even to buy those computers yourself. And so burden sharing as part of the entire Soviet bloc is a major advantage of the unified system of computing, which is often seen by technology historians as uh, backward, as lagging behind the West. But really, if you are Czechoslovakia, if you are Poland, if you are Romania, being enrolled in this network is a major advantage to you. There's a degree of specialization within the unified system, which leads to efficiencies in production. Uh, this does have some downward uh, sides. It does have some risks associated with it. Uh, for example, you are now reliant, if you're within the system, on foreign partners for the production of necessary peripherals, things like printers from East Germany or tape drives from Romania. And sometimes that reliance on foreign partners is good. The specialization leads to benefits. East German printers, Robotron printers, had a really high reputation in Czechoslovakia. But Romanian tape drives, not so much. So there's risks associated with this kind of specialization uh, within the bloc. Obviously, individual scientists and programmers benefit quite a bit from the kind of education that they have access to, the kind of academic collaboration that they have access to with the Soviet Union as a whole. Uh, many of those who I interviewed during the course of my year in Prague uh, mathematicians, programmers, computer scientists had done some of their early academic work in Moscow uh, and benefited from that time tremendously and have nothing but positive things to say about that experience. So it kick-started a lot of careers. The downside, distributed knowledge across the block when you're using computers that were built in Minsk but you don't actually know how to repair them with what parts and the, you can't get the parts very easily. Uh, this leads to a problem of information asymmetry, where the computers are built in a different country, and now your technicians are responsible for repairing them. Uh, it causes a lot of problems from time to time. Uh, there's also a loss of autonomy. Uh, oftentimes, you would have an organization like Inorga, which is responsible for planning the integration of computers into industries, into government offices. Inorga would order a computer for a factory that had never requested one, the computer would show up and sit on sidings in a box for up to six months before finally a technician from a completely different office from the, from the uh, Narodny Organizacje Technicke Obsluhi, uh, NOTO, they would come and actually install the computer for you at the factory that you never wanted in the first place. But now it's been sitting for six months and parts inside have rusted or it's been stored in uh, inadequate conditions. And so now the computer doesn't work. And so another technician has to be sent in from the country in which it was built. So it could take sometimes over a year simply to get a computer installed in a facility. Um, so this process of international distributed knowledge and block-wide involvement had benefits, but it also carried serious risks. So that's the government. Let's talk a little about the home market in Czechoslovakia in the 80s. The home market was chaotic. There was very little degree of planning that went on for the home market in the 80s in Czechoslovakia. To the extent that there was planning for the home market, it largely relied on the youth organizations and the clubs that were present in the country. And instead of focusing on one club, such as the Socialist Youth Organization, um, what the Czechoslovak government essentially did was it, it gave computers on a case-by-case -case basis to different kinds of clubs in different situations um, in a very chaotic and unplanned manner. So despite the stereotype of a command economy where everything is dictated from above to below, this is really not the case for the home market. It's really just a scramble for computers. Sometimes the government is buying, is purchasing in bulk. Uh, computers like the Sinclair ZX Spectrum from Britain 
and then distributing those to particular clubs in Brno or Prague. Sometimes those clubs themselves are employing their members to go across the border and either smuggle or bring back and pay the taxes, the custom taxes, on the computers themselves. So it's very unplanned and very disorganized. Some of the computers that are made for schools, uh, which I'll talk about here in a second, like the PMD-85 or the IQ-151, uh, these are brought into the clubs once they're no longer used in the schools, or if the schools don't want them, or they simply don't have educators or technicians who are trained to use them and instruct uh, school children how to use them. Uh, really, although the computer market at home starts in 1985 in a big way, with the uh, loosening of export controls by the Paris-based Coordinating Committee on Export Controls. Uh, they allow 8-bit, uh, sort of weaker machines uh, to be uh, imported into the Soviet bloc. They still have bans on 16-bit machines at that time in 85. Um, so by 87, you have this pretty steady flood of Western imports that are coming into the country to satisfy a computer market that on the home basis, on the consumer basis, is never really fully addressed uh, by Czechoslovakia, by the government. Um, if I had time, I would show you, I have a sort of handmade map that shows this flood of imports coming in, but I think I will, I will skip that for lack of time. Uh, didactic, which ends up becoming the most successful uh, Czechoslovak manufacturer of computers, uh, starts in Skalica in Slovakia in 87, and as we'll see, actually becomes sort of a, a miniature success case uh, for the computer industry in Czechoslovakia. But Czechs and Slovaks are not really fully wedded to any one particular Western company, any one particular Western computer. Uh, they're really using computers from all over the place if you're growing up in this period. So this is based on survey data of over 400 computer users in a popular technology magazine of the late 80s. Um, and what it shows is that Although there are Western computers like the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, which is British, or the Commodore 64, which is Canadian, uh, that are being used in large numbers by Czech and Slovak youth during this time period, uh, you know, leading up to 89, what you're also seeing is some of these more exotic machines, like the Sharp MZ series. The Sharp MZ series doesn't even come with any uh, programming language or instructions in, in the, or instruction sets in the, in the ROM. You basically have to do everything yourself. Uh, it's a very exotic machine which never sold particularly well on international markets. But because it was relatively, in, relatively inexpensive and because there was such a scramble and hunger for computers, uh, even this machine was snapped up and used uh, by Czech and Slovak youth. And what I want to point out here, if I can, maybe this has a laser pointer, ah, great, it has a laser pointer on it, uh, is that the third most popular computer throughout this period is the Didactic Gamma. It's a Czech made machine, it's not a Western machine. Uh, and in part that's because Didactic was able to successfully make their own clone of the ZX Spectrum down here, which was an enormously popular and successful computer because it was so cheap and because there was really oodles of software available for it uh, in the 80s that could be used already and that were already cloned and hacked on the private market. And again, you can see that the whole PC market was growing during this time period as a whole. However, Atari, which was enormously successful into the 90s, despite the fact that they were mostly selling the Atari 800, which came out in 1979, uh, and the domestic computer curve here, Didactic, these are growing the fastest into the 1990s. And these are 8-bit machines, which were state-of-the-art in the early 80s in the United States and elsewhere. But here they're still being used well, well into the 90s. And they're being hacked, as we will see, in some creative ways, both on the hardware level and on the software level, to do things they were never intended to do. So uh, ironically, the home computing market was not really sustainable without some kind of, you had to go outside your home. You had to be involved in the socialist clubs, in the youth organizations. These were sort of the seed crystals around which an entire informal market of exchange, especially for software, developed in the 80s. So you had to go outside the home. You had to engage with your peers. You had to swap tips. You had to go to somebody to help fix your computer when it broke down because you couldn't just go to the store and buy a new computer because the market didn't support that. So all kinds of informal, tacit, hands-on knowledge uh, 
is being exchanged from person to person, peer to peer within this network that are focused on the clubs and the socialist youth organizations, um, and also physical goods, right? The exchange of actual software and tape cassette from person to person. So the primary formal organizations were these clubs, uh, SPAZARM, the Union for Cooperation with the Military, uh, SSM, which is the Socialist, Socialist Youth Organization, uh, DDM, which is for younger children, Dum Dieta Mladeje, um, and CES Veta S, which is the more professional college level organization for those who are already interested in science and technology um, at universities like Czech, Te Czech Technical University in Prague. Um, but besides the formal organizations, you also had club life focused around things like science fiction fan clubs, uh, around fans of the spectrum, speckies they called themselves, around the Atari. Because the Atari software and the spectrum software were not just plug and play. You couldn't swap between the machines. Once you had an Atari, you were wedded to that machine, to its architecture, to its software. So the clubs were a way for you to find like-minded individuals who might have games that you can swap back and forth, who might have tips about how to speed up the baud rate on your Atari, as we will see. Uh, so these clubs were a real lifeline at a time when there isn't much in the way of a formal structure. There are some magazines, uh, one of which is formal and nationwide, called Microbase, uh, some of which are just fanzines, like ZX Magazine, um, focused on the Sinclair ZX uh, spectrum. But there's a real shortage of formal uh, architecture here. Uh, so you have to be involved with other people in an informal peer network. Uh, the government relied on the clubs so much so that in the late 1980s, when you have this explosion of amateur computer users in Czechoslovakia, a lot of them are questioning why they can't simply go to a store and buy a computer, why they can't go to a store and find any software on the shelves that they can use whether it's for professional uses, as I said, spreadsheet software, text editors, um, or just games. And the federal electronics minister, who's the head of a bureau that was established in 1980 to serve just these needs, because Czechoslovakia was trying to plan for the future, Milan Kubat, he responds to all these questions and complaints by saying, software is everywhere. It's lying on the street. You just have to pick it up. Uh, you can go to virtually anywhere in any major city and find informal groups of people who can exchange software for you, um, or you can find marts that are selling it on an unofficial grade market basis. So what about schools? So homes were completely chaotic. Schools were only somewhat less chaotic than homes as a market for computers. So for schools, the country did have more of a plan in place. They began small-scale batch production in the number of thousands of computers uh, by 1984. Uh, the plan was to integrate these computers uh, in their tens of thousands was the ideal uh, plan, to integrate these computers into the school system by 1985. This never materializes. Uh, batch production proves a lot more challenging than the government had planned for. In part because what they're trying to do is they're trying to use a combination of parts, computer parts and accessories that they're purchasing on a wholesale basis from countries like Taiwan or places like Hong Kong. And then they're assembling these by hand in some of the manufacturing facilities together with reverse engineered check made components like the Tesla MHB 8080A microprocessor, which took six years to reverse engineer from the original Intel 8080 microprocessor which came out in 74, the Tesla chip is available by 1980, and they're trying to integrate it with components that are made in the country, some of which are sourced from outside the country. And they're doing it all by hand, and economies of scale don't really apply. So this is a sort of hybrid cottage industry, where the production levels are batch-based and fairly low. Uh, nevertheless, you do have some of them, like this Zavt PMI-80 terminal, which was made in Slovakia. Uh, that are being integrated into schools already, especially uh, some of the more prestigious schools like the Czech Technical University in Prague, um, already in the early 80s by 84, 85. Uh, pictured here is a young woman, a student at the Czech Technical University who's using a Zoft PMI 80. Uh, and the magazine that uh, pictured her, uh, Abeseda, um, is sort of proudly announcing in the caption of the photo that, you know, look, all of these terminals are occupied year round morning to night by students who are just eager to learn programming. They're eager to work with computers. And this is a sort of implicit defense also of the lack of computers that were available for most schools. 
Yes, there aren't many computers, but the ones that are there are used extensively, morning and night, never switched off. Constant use, constant efficiency. But the numbers remain low. And I want to come back, circle back to this idea of partial network engagement, the benefits of it in this case for the home and for the school market. For the government market, we saw that the benefits of partial network engagement were not being fully wedded to one computing paradigm, not being wedded to the JSEP uh, and SMEP paradigm, which was focused on mainframes and mini computers. Because if they had been, when the 90s came around, which were focused on network personal computers, since that was the paradigm that ultimately emerged triumphant for the market in the 90s, if they had been fully wedded to mainframes and mini computers, they would have had a serious opportunity cost. They would have had a lost generation who did not really understand how to work with some of these network personal computers that flooded in the country after the revolution in 89. So for the home and computer market, what are the benefits of partial, partial network engagement? I would argue that one of the benefits of partial network engagement is that a lot of these machines that we have talked about, and I'll go back real briefly here to this graph, these machines do not interact with each other very well. They don't play nicely together. You have to learn how to program in machine code, in many cases, on these weaker 8-bit machines in order to make them do anything interesting, or simply in order to hack software, hack games, so that there's a check language option, uh, in order to make things like calculator spreadsheets work on machines that were never really designed to accommodate those. In many cases, the Atari 800 and ZX Spectrum and the Commodore 64 in the Western markets were really just used for games for most consumers. But in this market, because it might be the only computer that you can get a hold of, it is your home computer. You have to make it work as a fully functional home computer. And so you largely need to either teach yourself or be involved in these informal networks of peer participation and exchange in order to make this work for your situation. So I would argue that's a benefit because when the 90s come around, the country is still poor after the revolution. It does not automatically overnight become wealthy enough to simply buy all the computers it needs on a state-of-the-art basis from Western countries. What it has to do is it has to keep making these old Soviet machines work so that the business of government can grind on. And it has to make a lot of these Western machines that come in, some of which are outmoded, many of which are exotic and were never all that popular and may not have a lot of software associated with them, you have to make it work for your situation. And they do. They make it work for the situation. And in the process, an entire generation of young people who come of age in the late 70s and the 80s and the early 90s, they cut their teeth on these machines and they become quite skilled users. So that when foreign investment pours into the country, whether in the form of Microsoft or IBM, which is a large park, technology park um, in Brno now, uh, they find a whole skilled user base of potential employees. And moreover, the country itself has skilled and entrepreneurial people who will spin off their own small businesses and sometimes very large businesses, like a vast antivirus, which holds a large market share of the world antivirus market today, which is Czech-based and grows out of 1987, and Spazarm and these, these socialist youth organizations uh, that lay the seeds or prepare the ground for a future skilled user base. So uh, according to my mentor in the Czech Republic, Jaroslav Schvelk, who's a media studies scholar, uh, he argues that due to limited access to hardware, tools, and resources, Czech microcomputer enthusiasts, they became bricolures. They became people who were engaging these tactics, right, opportunistic tactics, um, not by choice, but by necessity, right? As I said before, they have to improvise and reuse all these existing pieces from around the world uh, to participate fully in digital modernity, and they do so. One example of this kind of hands-on innovation is the Turbo 2000 cartridge. This is a famous case in Czechoslovakia. Um, well, I should say Czech Republic and Slovakia. It's covered quite frequently. Um, the hands holding it in this photo are neither golden nor Czech, they are mine. Uh, however, the Turbo 2000 cartridge is an example of a Czech adaptation to the realities of limited computer accessibility. So what do you have? We well, have the Atari 800, which is produced in 1979, uh, ships out to the Western markets in November, November of 1979. And it's popular primarily as a games console, pretty underpowered, it's an 8-bit machine. And by about 82, 83, uh, it's no longer current in the market. Um, 
It's enormously popular in the Czech Republic because by the late 80s, by the early 90s, what is the Atari 800? It is inexpensive. It's cheap. But it has notoriously slow loading software from tape. There's a lot of software available for it. The software is relatively easy to modify in basic, but it loads very slowly into the system. So what do the checks do? Well, these clubs, the JRC and RICO programming clubs, uh, which are associated with the city of Ostrava, they develop this Turbo 2000 cartridge, which you plug into the Atari 800 and which automatically uh, makes your programs from tape load anywhere from 2000 to 6000 baud instead of 600 baud. This means that you can use this old machine, the useful lifetime of this old machine, is now far extended beyond what it was ever intended by the original manufacturer of the equipment. But it's a useful example of a check adaptation to a situation that's sort of beyond their control. Right? They're using tactics for their best opportunity, for their best advantage. Now what are the risks of partial network engagement, partial network involvement? So obviously they don't have the money as a country um, and there are ideological concerns, there are Cold War concerns in the 80s, so you can't be fully involved in the network of Western commodity computer exchange. You can't just buy all the computers that you want because a lot of them are legally restricted for sale to you. They're 16-bit or more powerful machines. Um, and even the ones that are less powerful than a 16-bit machine are often too expensive for you to afford very easily. Well, this is not all sunshine and roses. There are opportunity costs. Frankly, if you are a poor kid growing up in the Czech Republic or Slovakia, you are deeply unlikely to have owned a computer in this period. Uh, even when computers do make it through the Iron Curtain, when they are smuggled, when they are properly purchased and the taxes are paid, uh, even if you're buying a computer through Tuzex, which is the, the closed stores uh, for limited exchange, or later on in 1987, further when actual commodity computer stores open, even when you are doing that, the cost of the computers is extremely high. So one of my interviewees, Petr Jan Pius, who uh, was the president emeritus of Anglo-American University in Prague, at this time he was working at the Institute for Transportation in Prague, uh, he had two young sons in the 80s, and he wanted to buy them a ZX Spectrum, which had come out in 81, and which in the UK, where it was produced, where it was manufactured and sold, in the UK the ZX Spectrum was considered a cheap computer a first-time computer, a toy for kids. It only cost 99 pounds, which was unheard of uh, in terms of how inexpensive the computer was. By the time it made it to Czechoslovakia, by the time it was being sold in stores, this computer, which cost 99 pounds in the UK, cost 10 times as much in Czechoslovakia. It cost Petr Jan Pius two months of his yearly salary just to buy a computer that was considered a throwaway, kind of disposable toy for a lot of Britons by 1984. So obviously, if you were poor, you had much more limited access to computers. What this leads to is a kind of broad-based digital illiteracy. At the high end, Czech programmers, Czech skilled users and Slovak skilled users were very, very good. Because in an environment of scarcity, as we've said, they had to be good to make their machines work the way they wanted them to work. They had to program their own programs. Uh, they had to modify the machine's hardware to work in ways it was not intended to work in. But needless to say, this kind of experience is not for everyone. Not everyone wants to spend that much time learning how to program in machine code to make a computer do the things you want it to do. So while there were some, like Martin Maras, who I interviewed in Prague, who's a mathematician, who picked up on this very easily, who spent all their spare time learning how to program in BASIC, in machine code, in assembler. Most kids did not. And Czechoslovakia so poorly integrated its computers into schools that not only were there only a few computers available, so there were never enough computers in the schools, but also teacher training was an afterthought. And so even when computers did arrive in schools, even schools that were lucky enough to have computer labs, often did not have educators who were trained in how to use them or how to instruct students in programming. And so Marash, who basically learned and taught himself as an amateur, at the age of 14 found himself in his classroom in the computer lab teaching his fellow students how to program a basic because no one else was available. 
And his classmates were lucky that Marash was there, but most classrooms did not have a Marash. And most classrooms did not have computers for that matter either. Finally, there's a problem with retraining and, and reconciliation of hardware and software. And what I mean by this is that a generation that grew up on 8-bit machines well into the 1990s knew how to program BASIC, knew how to often program machine code. But they didn't understand how a lot of current up-to-date spreadsheet software worked because they never had access to it. They never had access to computers that had that kind of software, which was standard throughout much of the Western world by the 1990s. So when foreign companies arrived, there was a process of retraining that had to go on in how to work with things like computer-aided design software uh, because that simply was not available on any kind of systemic or large basis in, in the country prior to 89. And there's also the problem with hardware and software reconciliation. As I, as I said earlier, uh, the government, the ministries, the industry, the military, uh, all ran on, for the most part, fairly outmoded mainframes and mini computers that had been part of that JSEP and SMEP, that part of the unified system of Soviet computing. And they faced problems going into the 1990s because when these machines were no longer really up to the task, they were hard, sometimes impossible to repair because the production facilities in places like Minsk that had produced them had either gone out of business or did not employ the number of technicians or did not produce the spare parts that they used to produce uh, during the 80s or during the 70s. And so increasingly, for a while, they're able to cobble together solutions to this on a local basis. But this is clearly not a sustainable solution, and there's an enormous cost in the 1990s and into the, into the 2000s, really, uh, that, the Czech, that the Czech and Slovak governments have to bear simply to repair and maintain and then eventually replace all of these existing systems, which have been put in place. And the same goes for homes and schools. Schools continue to use older Czech-made computers, older Soviet computers, older East German computers, well into the 1990s at a point when that was no longer the state of the art, if it, if it had been, even in the early, early on in the 1990s. Uh, and it meant that a lot of kids either had to teach themselves because what was available in schools was not adequate, or uh, they had to learn very roughly in an abrupt transition once they went to colleges like Czech Technical University, which had better facilities, which had newer computers that had been brought in from the West. So there is quite a gap here that has to be overcome uh, in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Brief bibliography. I have far outrun my time, so I'll skip that last part there, and I'll open it up for questions. Yes, we have 10 minutes. Yeah, sorry about that. And I'll sit down. Yes, Dr. Levin. You alluded in a few places to piracy, pirating mm -hmm. um, software, exchanging it uh, illicitly, um, and I assume that means in violation of copyrights and things like that. In the West, yeah. In the West. Yeah. Um, was there you know, two questions based on that? First, were there any qualms about this? Okay. And. Secondly, was there any attempt on the part of the copyright holders in the West to try to prevent this from happening? Mm -hmm. This is a great question. Uh, so in response to the first question, the answer is no. There are virtually no qualms. There are no qualms that I can find about this. Uh, virtually no one is even embarrassed that this is going on. Uh, as you saw at the federal level, you have the electronics minister basically saying, go out and do that. That is the de facto solution to this problem of, of software shortages on the shelves. Um, the interesting cultural transition occurs not even right away in the 90s, but actually by the late 90s. You have a cultural transition occurring where in the magazines, you can start to see editorials that are reflecting on this phenomenon as a shameful fact, as a fact that relates to the poverty of the country and also of the laziness of the users. And they start to chastise people. Um, and. Part of the problem is that beyond those editorials and those magazines, I'm not sure what other examples I could give you of this cultural transition, but it does seem to be happening by the late 90s when the country's on a little firmer, little firmer footing financially, economically, um, and when culturally the country is trying to put itself in line with standard practices, best practices, 
uh, including copyright law, which starts to be enforced not right away, but I think by 94 in the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Um, so once copyright law starts to be enforced, once you have this cultural transition occurring where, the, where people are a little better off financially and can't excuse piracy as a function of poverty so much anymore, then that occurs. Yeah, but I would say certainly by 2000. Yeah. Vitaly. Um, thanks so much for the great paper and sorry I came in a little late. Uh, as I believe I told you before, my dad was a computer programmer in the 60s and 70s and mm -hmm. 80s, so I can very much relate on those, to those kind of things. You mentioned uh, the, those uh, Czech enthusiasts and uh, scholars uh, working with the Soviet Union, and you referred mostly but to going to Moscow, mm -hmm. but Kiev actually was the main center for yes. computer science research because of Wolschko and his institute. So this was sort of an anomaly in the otherwise very centralized uh, Soviet system. Mm -hmm. Given that Ukraine is relatively closer to Czechoslovakia, even though that not necessarily would be an advantage because mm -hmm. travel by plane had to be via Moscow, but you right. could conceivably travel by train. Uh, do, do you know if they work with the Hlushko Institute in uh, Kyiv at all? So I apologize, I should have mentioned Kyiv uh, because as you pointed out, that's, that's correct. And I actually had one of my participants who did train mm -hmm. in Kyiv in the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, and that was a very fond memory of his. Also, he trained at the NATO school in, the name escapes me, but it was in West Germany at the time. Mm -hmm. He somehow got permission. He felt like he had really gamed the system. Mm -hmm both in being able to go to Ukraine to train, but also being able to leave, out, leave, leave the country and go to West Germany to train at the NATO school in Mark Toberdorf. Well, eh, that might be wrong, um, but relatively near the Czech border. Um, but he was the only participant I'd interviewed who had had the chance to train in Kyiv. A couple of the other ones, probably because they were older participants and were already professionals in this period of the 70s and 80s, um, and sometimes have been trained not in computing specifically, but often in other disciplines, mm -hmm. and then made the, made the hop to computing. So Petrian Pius, who I brought up earlier, uh, he was trained initially in nuclear physics. Uh, so this may be why he was in Moscow, and also worked with computers there, and then later took that training to Czechoslovakia, where he sort of shifted into computers by the late 60s. And if we can have a, a mm -hmm. very quick follow-up. Uh, in terms of accessibility and availability of computers, mm -hmm. uh, are you able to provide a rough estimate as to within the Soviet bloc countries, mm -hmm. where was Czechoslovakia vis-a-vis -vis, uh, East Germany, Poland, Hungary, uh, other countries, uh, in terms of how far they went, yeah. how advanced they were um, regionally? Yes and no okay. is the answer to that. I, I could probably do that, although not with figures that I have in my head at the moment, uh, with the government mm -hmm. uh, statistics that I have. I could probably measure those other available government statistics in Poland, in East Germany, with the Soviet Union. Um, and in fact, the statistics that I've been using often will list the computers that the Soviet Union has and compare them to what Czechoslovakia has, mm -hmm. although not usually other countries like Poland or East Germany. So with government computers, probably. Uh, with home computers or computers in the schools, the answer is probably no. Uh, because, and, and much smarter people than me have explored this and written about this, so I feel confident in saying this is the answer. Um, but there just weren't good statistics kept in home computing. Mm -hmm. So when I have, and this might be a good time actually for me to have an excuse to do this, if I can find the, yeah. yeah how do I, no. Nope. I wanna click on this so I can show you here. So I based my estimate on the penetration of home computing in Czechoslovakia on survey data that I took from a popular technology magazine at the time, which functioned as a kind of market for software. Oh, it's not on the screen. How do I? Good call. I will try that uh, because yeah, this is a useful this is a useful map. It'll just just a second here. Yeah, here we go. So I made this map based on surveyed data, and what I did was this magazine. Everyone would write into the magazine and they'd say, 
I am so-and-so, I live in this place, I have this kind of computer, I'm looking for software that works with the Atari 400, for example, um, you know, I will swap this other thing. So it's, it's kind of a market in the pages of this, this, this journal. So what I did was I plotted over the course of six years um, the locations of all of those users. And one thing that I found interesting was just the distribution and, and where people end up. So unless you know kind of the distribution of population in the Czech Republic, it doesn't necessarily make sense. But for one thing, it's fairly widespread across the whole country. But another thing, it's clustered in this period of the late 80s, closer to the Polish border, closer to the East German border than really where the population actually lives. And that's a result of the fact that it's much easier to get computers through East Germany or through Poland than Czechoslovakia, which is relatively tightly locked down. Mm -hmm. But this kind of more impressionistic look at the spread and distribution of home computing at the time is about all that I can get simply because the government didn't bother to keep statistics on home computing. And I don't really blame them because a lot of the home computing that was going on was through machines that were either smuggled in or brought in in various ways the government didn't think was worth keeping track of. Does, uh, yeah. My guess is just anecdotally, it mm -hmm. seems that even though Czechoslovakia was fairly tightly controlled, it was probably ahead of some of its peers. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, you know, even though it's, it's one person's experience, mm -hmm. even though I'm a son of a computer scientist, right. I did not get to seriously work with computers until I came to this country in 1989 and experienced a college computer lab. We have nothing like that even at Moscow State University mm -hmm. if you're not a computer science student, but well, we're in the humanities and social sciences. That's possible. The Soviet Union was more tightly controlled, uh, for one thing. And also, Czechoslovakia benefited from sort of being in the middle of two different routes of software smuggling exchange. One, uh, which, which is not my original contribution, it's Jaroslav Schalk's point, but one of which was coming through Poland uh, from the north, and one of which is coming from Yugoslavia up through Hungary and into Czechoslovakia from the south. And so in Yugoslavia and Poland, to relatively loose markets that were not very tightly controlled for imports, um, a lot of times these things would be taken from the UK, especially, brought into Poland and Yugoslavia, and then brought into Czechoslovakia on kind of a third-hand basis mm -hmm. at that point. Um, but you're right that it, they probably have more access to computers than, say, Romania or Bulgaria did. But I would probably say that Yugoslavia or Poland had a better computer market than Czechoslovakia at the time. Would be my guess. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Ersel. I wanted to follow up on something you mentioned about the government mm -hmm. and setting priorities. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Moscow in 1991 at a conference, but also through research. Mm -hmm. So I was there for a month and kept a diary. And I've been going over it. And looking at it, the government had just built a huge new facility mm -hmm. for the Academy of Sciences, just opened on Moscow River mm -hmm. by the Gagarin statue on Nevsky Prospect, um, the Nevsky Prospect, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, they put a lot of money into that. I went into it saw it. Did I see any computers? <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the little old women in the hotel were using the abacus to mm -hmm. count up your bill for meals. Uh, so somewhere priorities got lost. Mm -hmm. Is that true? And, uh, I, I think the problem is not so much that priorities got lost as that there were different priorities for different competing interest groups. So computer users were split between professional computer users and amateur computer users. And although there was interchange between them, they never formed a united block to pressure the government to, for example, embrace microcomputers. Because the professionals were sitting over here in the, in the scientific institutes, and they were pretty happy. Uh, I, I talked to one of them, who Josef Gruska, who's now in uh, Brno, but at the time he was probably the country's most famous computer scientist, um, probably still is, he's still alive. Uh, and Dr. Gruska said that, look, when we went to the government and the government asked us what we needed, uh, all of us professionals said, 
we want more access to journals from the West. They didn't clamor for more computers because they were pretty much contented with, with what they had. Um, because they were a kind of elite priesthood uh, of computing professionals, and they had what they wanted for the most part. Amateur users were scrambling for any computers they could get, but they were mostly younger and mostly didn't have any institutional pull, and so the state didn't really respond to them as a, as a pressure group, really. And also, there were different competing interest groups within the state itself because different ministries saw different paths forward for computers. Um, and they were all lobbying uh, the planners in the Central Committee for the same small pool of money, um, which when it was split, when that small pool of money was split, wasn't very effective at doing anything well, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of the problem. Is if they had focused on one particular direction, maybe it would have been better. But in Moscow, for example, I mean, Gorbachev after 85 is trying to put computers in schools just like it's happening in Czechoslovakia. And again, it's a case of they don't really have enough money to fully work with the scientific institutes or the schools, and they're trying to do both, unfortunately. So, um, and I, I think that that was, I think there was nobody overseeing that from the top who could see that these priorities were fragmented in this way and do anything about it. That had control, so, yeah, good question. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Wonderful. Appreciate it.